Hello and welcome to this interview. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Lara Millane from Northeastern University in Boston. Lara, it's so great to have you on. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's fantastic to be here. Lara, nanomedicine-based mRNA vaccines have played an important role in helping us fight the SARS-CoV-2 virus over the past two years. And as you write in a recent paper, without the nanomedicine component, mRNA and DNA-based vaccines would have little efficacy. What excites you most about the recent research we've made in translational nanomedicine? I think the most exciting thing about the application of nanomedicine for these SARS-CoV-2 vaccines is that what this has really demonstrated is that the science was ready. The science was already ready to go. The turning point for developing these vaccines, uh, for example, the main examples I'll use is the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which are mRNA-based vaccines against the spike protein for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Those uh, vaccines really, the moment that the genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was published, that enabled scientists to design mRNA against the spike protein, but the nanomedicine was there. This platform uh, that Moderna had and Pfizer had, they already had on their laboratory shelves. So that is so exciting that uh, we have had the science and it's ready to go, but we've just been held up in clinical trials. And before the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines were developed, most nanotechnology and nanobased medicines were just for cancer. So we have gone from only uh, hundreds and thousands of cancer patients taking an, a nanomedicine to a great majority of the population. And what he, we have seen is that the safety has been demonstrated. So safety is one of the biggest challenges in clinical trials. And we've really demonstrated that. So that is so exciting. And those of us who do drug delivery, we've always been, it's kind of this ominous tunnel. You, you start out in the laboratory and you think we're developing this great medicine, but it's going to be 15, 20 years before it can ever reach a patient. But that hasn't happened here. We went, we, there was phenomenal fast tracking. So from the moment that genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was published, it was actually less than a year that it was at, being administered to patients. We went through uh, drug development, we went through preclinical trials, um, and then to humans, and that is groundbreaking. So not only is nanomedicine enabling, but we have changed the landscape of clinical trials. For example, last week, there was a publication, a news release by the NIH, the National Institute of Health in America that said that Moderna and Scripps Institute have partnered and they've started a phase one clinical trials of three different HIV sequence, uh, message RNA vaccines for HIV. And this is based on the same a nanomedicine platform that Moderna has used for the SARS-CoV-2. So this is already changing the landscape of not only nanomedicine, but clinical trials, which is just, it's time. It's time that we change this and that we speed it up. So the question is really, what else is on laboratory shelves that we haven't touched yet that we don't know about and that is enabling? So a lot of people have heard of biotechnology and nanomedicine, uh, but pharmaceutical science is kind of this dinosaur that not a lot of people know about, but it actually is the science of medicine. So uh, my specialty is pharmaceutical science and nanomedicine. And the reason that I went into nanomedicine is because of uh, this, some, this property called surface area to volume ratio. So if you think of drug delivery, Nanomedicine is really not just drug delivery, but drug delivery at its very finest. So let's uh, take the scenario where we have a cube of drug. Let's say it's one centimeter by one centimeter. That surface area of that 
particle of that drug, the surface of the drug is going to be six square centimeters. Now, if we take that a step further and say, all right, let's try to package this drug a little bit better and put it into one millimeter cubes, then we have a total surface area of the drug that's now increased to 60 square centimeters. But now let's take it even further and take that cube of drug and package it into one nanometer cubes that are one nanometer by one nanometer. We have suddenly increased the surface area to 60 million square centimeters. And that is phenomenal. It's just amazing. So why does that matter? Well, you take this drug and now you're protecting it so well that you are packaging that drug very, very efficiently. Um, so not only are you protecting the drug, but you are able to theoretically administer a lower dose. So you'll have less toxicity. And you also have a greater surface area where you can add antibodies, targeting peptides. Um, so that is, to me, that is why I went into drug delivery and nanomedicine, because you're able to not only deliver drugs, but deliver them in the best way possible. And that's what's happening with these SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Without them, without the nanomedicine protecting that message RNA, the message RNA would be degraded and we wouldn't even be able to administer it because there's RNases, which are enzymes that digest RNA. They're in the environment, they're in our bodies. Um, so the RNA wouldn't be able to make it to elicit an immune response. Nanomedicine rose to the challenge and was there and was ready. And nanomedicine, the safety has been demonstrated. So we have had the largest phase four clinical trial, which is post-market release of a nanomedicine. So now the door is wide open. Um, so yes, I think those are the most exciting things. And one of the other things I just wanted to mention is we, um, everybody has now heard of the term of nanomedicine. Uh, but just something to uh, bring up a side point is nanotechnology has been around for a long time. Uh, we've all seen those stained glass windows in churches. Um, those are actually colloidal metal based windows that are stained with different colloidal metals. And uh, one of the most common is gold and silver, varying the ratios of gold and silver. Uh, when I started out in drug delivery, I actually started out with gold nanoparticles. Um, now I work with lipid particles because they're more biocompatible, um, but the properties of colloidal metals actually change. So with, uh, I have some old nanoparticles that I made a long time ago. Uh, these are uh, gold nanoparticles that are more kind of purple, and you can see that the size of the particles is related to their color. These particles here that are more red, are actually a lot smaller than those bluer ones. So there's, uh, and normal gold doesn't look like this. Normal gold, I, you probably won't be able to see it, but this is my failed attempt, my first attempt at making gold nanoparticles. And uh, the gold actually crashed out and there's gold flecks in the bottom of the glass. But normal gold doesn't look red or, or blue, it looks gold. So you're changing the properties. And that's exciting as well because we're we're able to elicit new properties of these materials at the nano scale, and yes, so that's my reasons why it's so exciting. Laura, with these recent progresses that we've made in nanomedicine, so can we now also expect that more mRNA vaccines are, will emerge, and if so, for which viruses? Um, absolutely. So we are, um, as I mentioned, we're already seeing new vaccines for HIV and the three that are being tested simultaneously, which also um, isn't often done, testing three different sequences at the same time. This is for the spike protein of the HIV virus. But I think we're going to see not only more message RNA vaccines, but also more RNA, DNA, and peptide-based therapeutics because nanomedicine, especially lipid nanoparticles, uh, which are uh, what the Pfizer and Moderna um, particles are, are actually able to 
uh, incorporate both hydrophobic and hydrophilic mo molecules. So um, I think that we're going to see uh, the door is open right now it's because mRNA, if you have a, a, an mRNA sequence, then you're able to produce that protein in your target cell. So message RNA, the central dogma of molecular biology is DNA to RNA to protein. So now that we have uh, the system for delivering message RNA, that means that we can go from RNA to protein. So we can theoretically get any protein produced. That means that we have a platform now for diseases ranging from cancer to neurodegenerative disease. Um, for example, in cancer, a message RNA, if we delivered a message RNA for a pro-apoptotic protein, a protein that induces cell death, then we could deliver that, put a targeting peptide on the surface of that particle, deliver it to specifically to cancer cells, and then get them to produce this pro-apoptotic cell death factor to kill the cancer cells. On the flip side, in neurodegenerative disease, there is a buildup of misfolded proteins, whether it's beta amyloid or tau, depending what camp you're in. We can deliver message RNA for an autophagic factor such as LC32, which increases the rate of autophagy, which is cell recycling to get the cell to uh, fix itself. And then another example would be progeria, which is an accelerated aging disease where children, their, their tissues are aging and they might be young, but look and feel very old. So an example for progeria would be to administer um, mRNA for the regular laminate protein, which these patients lack, which is a nuclear envelope protein, and an siRNA, which siRNA actually degrades proteins, and siRNA for progerin, which is the abnormal protein. So we have this dynamic system, these platforms, this lipid-based nanoparticles and liposomes, which are the clinically approved uh, formulations, are able to deliver these message RNA particles or molecules as well as siRNA. So siRNA is the flip side of message RNA. Message RNA is going to produce the protein that you want whereas siRNA is going to silence of some kind of sometimes called small interfering RNA, and that's going to silence a protein that you don't want. So now we have the system where we can produce any protein or silence any protein. So really the application is endless here. We could apply this to any disease and it's um, just phenomenal. And I really think that the pandemic has been challenging. It's been awful. Um, it's been so difficult. It's been isolating. Uh, there's been a lot of dust, but the science and the medicine, this is groundbreaking. And the world has changed from the pandemic, but also medicine has changed from these vaccines and the nanomedicine approvals. So you just mentioned also there are other diseases uh, that actually the advances we've now made in nanomedicine open up a lot of additional options for, for new treatments of other diseases. What comes to your mind practically, um, which diseases and, and um, what do we need to maybe do now next to actually uh, uh, find these new uh, solutions? Uh, we could apply this to a wide spectrum of diseases from cancer to neurodegenerative disease, to progeria, to diabetes, I, I think that the application is endless, but there are some things that need to be done. First off, all of us know that the efficacy wanes. So for the message RNA vaccines, we needed to take a booster. They We did kind of jump the gun on the booster requirements because in the USA, the booster requirement actually came out based on just a single study in Israel of 30 or so patients who were 65 or older. So when that study came out, which didn't have a lot of data, the CDC in the United States recommended the booster dose. 
it wasn't until later that robust large studies came out about uh, the need for the booster. But now we know that the efficacy really does decline. So that's something that we need to troubleshoot and we need to address that because if the efficacy is going to decline so rapidly, we need to think about what applications we're looking at and how we can optimize that. So the efficacy is one thing that needs to be looked at. There are some off-target effects, although the safety is dramatic and just amazing. There has been some off-target effects, and most of these deal with the microvasculature. And if you think about it, um, those of us in nanomedicine and drug delivery, we talk about this all the time, especially in cancer research. It's, there's something called the enhanced permeability and retention effect in cancer, where uh, we exploit, nanomedicine pre preferentially accumulates at the site of a tumor due to the leaky vasculature and the haphazard vasculature because normal vasculature, the cells are together and there's tight junctions. But in cancer cells, um, they're constantly, there's constant remodeling and they're uh, destroying vessels, growing over vessels, and they're not really, you can think of them, this, these cancer cells as rude cells. They're just uh, going to invade their neighbor and they don't care if it's a, a blood cell that they're killing. So there's this leaky constant, uh, leaky vasculature and constant remodeling. So due to that leaky vasculature, there's a preferential accumulation of nanoparticles inside of a solid tumor. And that relates to some of the off-target effects that we're seeing in patients where they're related to microvascular changes. Uh, so uh, nanoparticles do preferentially accumulate in the microvasculature and leaky vasculature. It's not a challenge to safety. It's a small population that has seen these uh, side effects, but it is something that would need to be addressed. The other issue that needs to be addressed here to to take nanomedicine really where it needs to go in the future is, I think, public education, uh, which is so great what you're doing here. There's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of fear when people don't know about something. Um, I've had people ask me, well, uh, or say to me, well, the vaccines are nanorobots. And it's like, no, they're not. So nanorobots don't exist yet. So I think the future applications, we, we need to educate the public more about nanomedicine and the safety and what it actually is. And then I think we have a little bit of a way to go just with the optimizing mainly the advocacy. Great, Lara, thank you so much for sharing all this uh, information and also for sharing your time. All the best of luck with your further research. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it.